Chair Dr. Chesub Lee, who's the Director of Telecommunication and Standardization Bureau at ITU. Dr. Sharad Sapura, who's Director of the Global Innovation Center at UNICEF. Mrs. Cornelia Richter from GIZ. Dr. Jim Poisant and Mrs. Helene Galpaya from Learn Asia. Come on up. <coughs> Everybody here? No. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Ah, waiting for a microphone. Okay. Marvellous. Yes, Great. Okay. Well, if everybody's got their glass of water, they're all set and ready to go. Um, let's begin the um, discussion, I think, with um, uh, Dr. Chase of Lee. We uh, need to talk about 5G, the Internet of Things. Um, wh what do you think is the, the potential there in terms of um, developing this real idea of social impact? Do you think they could really make a difference, or are we kind of aiming too high? Should we be going for, going for something else instead? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I guess... Yeah, uh, now uh, I too I have a responsibility. The uh, responsibility in the TSB is a technical standard of development. One of our key subjects is 5G, 5G, as you said, and the Internet of Things, you know, some virtualization, softwareization. All this is our technology uh, subject. At this moment, uh, what I want to say is, think about the scope of our infrastructure. We develop technology to implement our infrastructures. 5G will provide you at least one gigabps such super band, I want to call super band, to every people through your mobile phone. That is a very big challenge of this, extend, extend our capacities to get of this connectivity, but also with connecting with IoT, extend of our infrastructures to your life itself. So it's a huge difference of changing of our infrastructure. Through this, I believe it's a 5G and the, uh, IoT, our life itself, I want to say, is more than the connected, connecting things, it's our life itself connected. So we will move forward to the connected life. So it's a very big impact of our technical development but not so much far, it's coming to very near soon. What do you think's the, when you say very soon, what do you think's the, the break at the moment? What's, what's standing in the way of the acceleration of that, of that process? Yeah, that process is uh, now, at least for example, the 5G, we had uh, today, the first, one of the first session was 5G pavement, pavement of this 5G road. It discussed whether we have some informed some of our Asian country like Korea, they want to show this 5G at year 2018 for the Winter Olympic Games, which means the January or February, not December. And the, uh, Japan announced the year 2020 for the commercial service of this 5G. That kind of sense of movement is uh, quite important for us, even in relation to this now most of the uh, industries very keen to develop IoT, so-called Internet of Things. This is another uh, move for uh, some force to develop of such extension of our infrastructures. I'm only from the technical side and the market side. I'd like to bring in um, Dr. Supra. Do, do you actually think that we're on the, in the right direction trying to go for those kinds of amazing whiz-bang technologies like 5G? What, what's the point of view from your side? Well, we, we focus our work largely on areas of disparity and areas where the population living in remote places, etc. <clears throat> and our idea is that while such technologies come there, and in some cases they won't reach because it doesn't make business sense, how can we create bridging technologies that would allow people who don't have access to 3G even, or 4G or 5G, uh, to have the experience <clears throat> which might be similar 
to those who have access to that? And then how do you create enough opportunities so that it starts making business sense for business houses to actually invest and in And how do you do it? Uh, we, uh, right now, just with one tool, we have 1.7 million users in 15 countries, uh, totally in remote areas where there's only 2G available. And they're increasing at the rate of about between six to 8,000 a day without any promotion, word of mouth, uh, because they just see the value of it. And the interesting thing is that in many of those areas, the operators, and these are mostly in Africa, have actually started putting infrastructure to provide 3G uh, and other things. So it, it works both ways. But There's a business case for it then? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, Jim, let's bring in you. Uh, we are talking about SMEs here an awful lot. Do you think we should be talking about SMEs at this event today when we're talking about accelerating towards these uh, goals of improving um, social uh, impact and things? Do you think we're going in the right direction? We should be talking about SMEs? Should we be talking about something else? I think there are, I think there are two, two different subjects here, but I think when you're looking at social impact and SMEs, um, I'd like to look at it this way. Maybe this will help ex describe a, the situation as I see it from a personal perspective. When you look out all across the globe, you find that if you look at the evolution of technology, the basic pillars are already there. In other words, you have operating systems, a couple of those. Um, you have those killer applications that are uh, out there. But what you find now is you find an inversion of, of applications that are occurring on the ground by young people, and not, not, and not in some cases not so young people, but they're doing it and most of them are having social impact. Mm. So if you look throughout Africa, for example, uh, there's a tremendous amount, hundreds of thousands of applications that are coming out to help farmers and nurses in villages and things like that. So it's interesting to, to, to see that that the topic being SMEs and, and social impact, it's happening naturally. It's happening naturally. And I think we have a tendency to, to, to uh, look at SMEs and think of the next Bill Gates. Uh, we need to stop doing that. Uh, we, need to, we need to look and empower uh, those folks that are doing it on the ground, that are helping people on a day-to-day -day basis. So the social impact is happening. It, it is really happening. The, 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 the challenge is to make sure that the good news about these social uh, impact applications are getting out so that other people can replicate them uh, you know, on, a, on a global scale. Uh, so th that, that would be one view. Uh, so now, if you divorce innovation for a moment and take SMEs, from an industry perspective, I represent about 90% of all the ICT companies around the globe. So what do they need in order to innovate? And there's some basic requirements of which the folks in this room are very, very involved in. Making sure that there are no, there, that there's enabling regulations that allow these, these uh, SMEs to develop and to, and to, and to be, uh, uh, and to grow. Uh, making sure that, that uh, countries invite investment by having a non-corrupt situation in their countries, because nobody's going to invest in a company that in a country that doesn't that doesn't trust. So um, and so the regulations are important. The, the the financing and the partnerships are very important. And I think once once you find that environment, then you find a nurturing and very um, um, uh, rapid growth within within those countries. So I think you got. Those two different sub topics, and I want to... Helene, what, what, what's your reaction to that? How, how do you feel about that? Um, I agree that not every entrepreneur is going to go be the next Bill Gates. So we study micro-entrepreneurs in South Asia, and they just want to have a normal life and have a decent income, so livelihood impact. They don't want to be in debt. They don't want to be in legal trouble. They want to be able to withstand financial, weather, health shocks that all people have, all of us, but poor people are particularly unable to withstand because they're very asset poor. Um, and connectivity has a role to play in this. The research is very clear that the biggest thing you can do 
is to give people a phone, a be it for calling or internet connectivity. Because once you do that, even without anything else, they self-coordinate, they check market prices, they call up their suppliers, they reach bigger markets, so for SMEs. So even without anything else, the access and the usage gap has to be bridged, and you'll see huge impact. And that evidence is pretty systematic and generalizable. So in that sense, I'm agreeing. And that has to do a lot with regulations, market certainties, and all of that. But the barriers faced certainly by micro-entrepreneurs and poor micro-entrepreneurs in South Asia and Southeast Asia have a lot to do with finances and uncertain regulation and disincentives to formalize because the taxation is so heavy. If they don't you know, register, you cannot pay taxes. You pay bribes. So there are other things other than just the ICTs and connectivity which have to come together really. Yep. How do you get phones into their hands, though, if, if phones is, is the key? How do you make that happen, get more phones out there, more kind of deployment, as it were? So you do it through encouraged investment. Investment is what gets people connected, right? So for investment, people want a return. You give regulatory certainty. Your country has to have an investment-friendly climate. Um, however, those are all necessary conditions. That's not enough because you could have investment and still have a monopoly. So after the regulatory actions, you need to make sure there's enough competition in the market so that the prices are actually affordable to people because there's no point in having a great monopoly supplier. You really want differentiated service. And that's a factor of competition. So all of this has to do with regulation, really. Step back and let private investment come in because it can do a lot. Use your money for improving your governance structures, making registration for SMEs easy. All of that the government can do because that services cannot be privately provisioned, like registering a business or paying your tax. ICT is getting a hand on, uh, getting people's hands on a phone can be privately provisioned. So just facilitate that. That's how you do it. Cornelia, what, uh, tell us a little bit about your organization and, and actually what, what you're doing, and then give your reaction to what's been said here. Well, um, I'm representing GIZ, which is the Implementing Agency for Technical Assistance in Germany, and we are working in 130 countries in all sectors, um, from health to private sector promotion, governance, uh, energy, climate change, uh, all social sectors. So the main uh, focus of our, um, um, or our core competence is capacity development. And uh, when it comes to the topics we are here for, um, we have a particular perception and we see uh, that ICT plays a very important role as an enabler in all these social processes. And so it's not a mean uh, in itself for us. So we do have a look where can we get in touch with social agents, uh, change agents in the respective countries. And uh, there is an abundance of creativity in, in uh, almost all countries. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Um, and... Um, we are liaising up with innovation hubs. Uh, we are supporting innovation hubs in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. And we are bringing these people together in Germany, in international conferences, in trying to exchange their ideas. And when you're mentioning the social impact of um, uh, small uh, and medium scale enterprises, our experience is that um, SMEs are not a guarantee in itself for uh, uh, creating social impact. Because social impact only is relevant if it creates um, a scaling up effect. Uh, and uh, scaling up effects do not just happen. In so far, I slightly disagree with you, Jim, uh, because social impact is not something which easily happens. It has to be systematically conceptualized from the very beginning. It has to be accompanied in order to create quality and it has to be monitored also in order to correct and that's where GIZ's role comes in as a facilitator of multi-stakeholder processes as uh, someone which, uh, uh, as an organization which provides um, training uh, and which brings people together. What are the people that you're, the, the clients that you're speaking to, what, what are the problems they're confronting? What are they coming back to you and saying, we really need, we need, we need to fix this? Uh, the clients, well, we have different clients. We have, uh, some of our clients are governments. In some cases, it's the private sector itself and um, 
And uh, in, uh, in those cases with the private sector, we try to liaise them also with the private sector in Germany. That's why we have very large uh, public-private partnerships also everywhere in the world. But uh, when it comes to governments, I think they, uh, they come with very general um, uh, demands. They say, bring us innovative solutions in order to provide better services for rural areas, for example. How can we approach our farmers? How can we speed up, the, uh, how can we improve value chains? And that's where our concepts come up and where we try to liaise uh, also with these change agents. And very often the resources are already available in the respective countries. Just looking at Africa, where we have 42 innovation hubs and uh, amazing ideas coming up from this scene, but everywhere in the world. and. Uh, um, very often this also is a surprise to the government and what we observe is that there is very little dialogue between the private sector scene and the governance uh, and, uh, and the government and that's where um, we also try to organize multi-stakeholder fora. In those cases where it is possible we also do involve the civil society which plays a very important role. Um, for example, uh, in Rwanda, uh, we were working together with Government and Transparency International. Uh, also, the government in Rwanda has had a very uh, clear uh, articulated interest in combating corruption. And they allowed the national chapter of Transparency International to come up with documentation and uh, uh, with platforms. Uh, you can only organize it if you have a very vivid civil society and uh, uh, which is encouraged and which can contribute to these platforms. These, these are framework conditions which are not possible in each and every country and we also do have to respect the cultural and the political situation in each and every country. In, in your experience in UNICEF, are the, right are the right kinds of conversations happening now? Well, <clears throat> one of our roles is to create the, uh, the platform for the right kind of conversations to happen. Uh, people are interested in seeing their lives change. We firmly believe that you cannot just depend on the government to do everything. And no government in the world has been able to meet all the needs of people. So the whole development model has to be done upside down, where people have to, t if you're looking at sustainable growth, people have to take ownership. And so, how can we make sure that people actually not only uh, engage in that conversation, but are involved in the designing of the solutions themselves? Mm -hmm. IT and coding is a tool. It comes in the end. It cannot mm -hmm. be the starting point. Mm -hmm. The starting point has to be people, what they need, mm -hmm. what they want. How do you connect them with the government? How do you get that conversation going? And once that conversation starts going, you will be surprised on the amount of ideas and solutions that people already have, mm -hmm. which they are practicing on a very small scale. They might not have the science and the technology and the financing backup, but if you can then facilitate that process, it's just amazing what happens and how quickly it goes to scale. Jim, what are your thoughts on that, on the kind of bottom-up concept mm -hmm. that, that he's talking about? What is the question? Is it what, what, what were your thoughts on that? Because he's talking about really getting down to grassroots level and asking people what it is that so they want the and then building, actually, building the, the strategies from there. Do you think that's the right way forward? Well, as, I, as mentioned, there's a, an enormous amount of creativity out there that's happening every day. I mean, these, the, 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 there, are, there are wonderful ideas uh, that are... No, but you need to have people nurture you. Uh, you know, if, if you look at it one way, Oftentimes, the people who create are not the people who can market. They're two different skill sets, and many many of these companies fail because they can't market. They don't know how. They don't know finances. You know, they'd much rather prefer to sit in a lab or, or, or sit on a computer and do what you know. So, there's lots of different elements. But I think a, a good idea, nurtured, you know, has a great opportunity to to, to catch on. Uh, but it has to be in the right environment. The ki these, these young people can't do it by themselves. Let's throw this out to some questions from the floor. Um, we have some microphones around. If you'd like to ask some questions, please go ahead. Anybody out there? OK. 
Okay. <laughs> Everybody's falling asleep. <laughs> End of the day. Uh, <laughs> End of just, the day. Just in the Go case, uh, let me try some further explanation of this. Because of this subject itself has a social impact, especially on the, uh, based on the ICT, we may think of two different views. Maybe during our talks it might be mixed together. I want to say by ICT and for ICT, many of the case ICT we understand very useful, very valuable to support of these social uh, innovations, especially for the SMEs, very helpful. That's true. But also, because of our technical development is going forward, especially in the case of 5G, we have many software-based approaches, even IoT, bring our this technology uh, application to the things. Thing means very small areas. I'm not quite too sure of this internal of things we will re we really look at. So another Bill Gates, I don't know. But at the least, these small groups, you, this IoT will give so another opportunity to make your own business in these small areas. Maybe something small verticals or regionalized very localized, but enough to engage use of these ICT technologies. Even for the SMEs, in generally SME have a lack of capabilities or capacities in many of areas, but this software-oriented small devices, another opportunity to challenge from the SMEs to build up their business. Even for, from the uh, regulatory or policy uh, considerations, localized areas, the small devices is a very good subject to release of this uh, mm -hmm. for the market-driven or industry-driven uh, approaches. I want to add of this point. So we are, our technology development in going that directions. What kind of specific uh, innovations do we need in terms of regulation then? So for me, mm -hmm. a, in case of this regulation, still. I'm not quite sure, or I'm a technical engineer. We are still in the stage, uh, telecom, is, telecom is one part of a very strict regulatory regime. IT is another different one. For example, the financial is another different one. If in the case, we really time to think about how we can develop further enough of this, our regulatory frameworks, intersectoral aspect. Even ICT has already had some convergence in many areas. But to apply of this, to use of that uh, technologies, we still have a barriers of this. For example, the health-related, or someone called health-related, but something, the other sense is a very emergency services, something have a happening of this automatic driving. What happened? How we can resolve of this? If not the case, this uh, technical innovation should not be happen. So that kind of things would be mm -hmm. IoT is uh, now close to your fingers, not only your bodies. So it's a, it's a subject for intersectoral discussions. Mm -hmm. I think when you ask what regulation do we need, there's a big hole in what you can do with the streams of data that's generated by Internet of Things or, mm -hmm. or, or your cell phone, for example. Who can use it, what you can use it for, who has access <coughs> to it, can you sell it? Uh, big black hole, I think we need to start the conversation about that. Even though this yeah, because we were talking about e-government earlier and, and your feeling was in fact that that wasn't necessarily particularly something that people wanted. Um, can you t elaborate on that a little, t tell the people here your thoughts? No, I, I mean, people want to be able to do services easily, but in poorly governed countries, everything is based on a relationship. So while you in Europe may be comfortable clicking a button and sending it to the black hole of government, realizing that it will get processed and you will get, let's say, an ID card at the end of it, most people in developing countries don't have that confidence and a relationship with the computer, but you have a relationship with the clerk who handles it at your local office, or you can find somebody who has a connection. So it's very relationship-based when governance is poor. And that poses a whole level of challenges for things like e-government, because people don't necessarily want to deal with this, you know. And, and the way people value their time value of money is quite different um, when you're rich versus poor. Uh, so 
uh, you may just go and you know stand in line and get it done. So it's going to be a tougher pitch, I think. Do you think there are some areas that basically should be left for 10 or 15 years down the line, and that in, t in talking about that e-health and e-government, that they should be just left aside for a while, and that the goals should be on development of um, market services, things that are much more common, should we say, in terms of you know buying and selling things or, or services or whatever. Do you think that that, that that should be the move, actually, in fact? No, I think governments need to prioritize. And if they understand their role, like the provision of certain types of health services or e-government, only they can do it, cannot be privately provisioned. So they need to get really good at it. They cannot move it down the priority list. There are others who are very good at doing things like the commercial services. Let those people do it. I think the fundamental problem we have is governments trying to do too much uh, when there are others willing to do it. I think that's a real problem. Is there enough? Go, go ahead. Yeah, I was saying it's not sequential. Yeah. Uh, I think it, ha it is happening simultaneously. Mm. The, the government priorities can often be dictated by public opinion. Mm. And so if government has a set of priorities, but there is enough public pressure, the challenge is how do you, uh, how do you aggregate the public voice and visualize it so the decision makers can actually see what the people are talking about? Uh, in our today's connected world, we also have connected problems. Uh, and <clears throat> even in highly evolved uh, societies in terms of technology, the parliamentarians are far away from what the public opinion is. Uh, all they are depending on newspaper polls and very small polls. But today, it is possible with technology to actually get public opinion at a very uh, short interval, aggregate that information, and make it a I'll give you a quick example. Uh, <clears throat> four weeks back, before that, we were talking with the uh, government of Liberia for three years about the fact that a lot of teachers in classrooms are actually asking for sex from the girl students to actually give good grades. And that was a conversation and all. And then what we did was we did a quick poll uh, three or four weeks back, and 86% of the respondents, and I'm talking about 50,000 people to whom the poll went, who are you reporters, responded that yes, it's a big issue. And then the response from the government was, oh, but these are random people. So we set up five phone lines and said, here's the phone number. If this is an issue, please call. The phones went off the hook. The result was within uh, the next day, a small group came together, and the government put together a team, issued a communique, and now they have people going out in the schools and actually finding out the facts. All this happened in a period of five days. Whereas for three years we have been, so there is a huge power of making uh, visible public opinion. We've seen in the last few months when people see that the government is not living up to the aspirations that they have set up, they take charge of things. 10,000 people with their cars to move uh, refugees from one place to the other. It's a whole different world. And it makes sense to actually use this social capital that people have and actually link it with the financial and policy capital that the government has so that whatever comes out is an informed policy. It might not be the same what the people are saying, but at least an informed policy and informed action. Yeah, it creates the dialogue effectively. Mm -hmm. But the, the flip side of that is security, I suppose, and, right. and, and the, the right to, to not have to share your opinion. Do you, do you think that's a genuine concern? Do you well, think something's going to fade? No, it is, a, it is a very genuine concern, and yeah. therefore, we make sure that it's anonymized, all the information. So even we don't know who's saying what. Mm. But it, at least you can aggregate it, make it visible. And certainly you will see in the most uh, uh, difficult countries, if I may use that word, government listens. And they are, uh, they are careful about what their next policy is going to be. And in some countries, the head of the state is now meeting these young people on a regular basis because they suddenly realize that their voice and their opinion, when aggregated, makes a large volume of their polling uh, constituency. What, what, what do the other speakers think about that? What's the, mm. what's the potential and what are the limits? Well, I think each and every technology bears uh, the opportunity of risks and uh, uh, but also chances, and um, 
Um, looking into the potential of e-governance, uh, I think, sure, there are risks uh, for the people, but there are also tremendous chances uh, in the process of democratization, also in, in terms of confidence building, because at the very end it boils down to improved services. Yeah. And if we look into the potential of providing uh, improved services for the citizens, I think even those governments who have certain barriers, and you rightly described it, I'm pretty much aware that in certain cultural contexts, uh, um, people are more used to face-to-face -to -face contact. Uh, looking into the history of my own country, I, you, you can't hear me? So, okay. Um, it also took several years that people got uh, used to uh, to e-governance elements, and sure, it's, uh, it's not a neither nor, it's um, a parallel system actually we are having. We also have to take into account the different e-literacy standards also in our country and in the other countries. In so far, I think uh, most of the governments are well advised at least in embarking on, in certain areas, on elements or on procedures for e-governance. Same holds true, looking into the potential of, uh, for the commercial sector, for the banking sector, look into the potentials for microcredits. I think it wouldn't be possible if this wouldn't have been also on a, uh, uh, by, by application of ICT in many countries and otherwise we wouldn't have reached this kind of um, uh, scaling up effects in many, uh, in many countries. In so far, I think in order to improve government as well as commercial and social services, there is no alternative to ICT. But as I also said, uh, it brings risks and um, people uh, in, in some parts of the world are very sensitive also to the control mechanisms which might go along with these kind of technologies and in these cases, a strong civil society can play a very important role. Ilani, what are your thoughts on that? What's your experience? Oh, I was actually just going to comment on this um, citizen consultation, which uh, Dr. Safra was talking about. I think that's absolutely vital, and the examples he gave are really fabulous. Uh, I only just want to caution, so I'm not disagreeing with him, I caution because, for example, things like asking people on a survey or on the internet, that in itself is a group of people who are already possibly privileged, right? Mm -hmm. um, not only on just, just this issue, but other things. So like in India, when they were talking about net neutrality regulation, they put out a consultation paper, over a million responses were received, and they were all pretty uniform. We did word analysis on that, saying, you know, we need a completely neutral internet, we should ban all free services, etc., etc. Those are the people who are middle class, have a computer at home or work, who are able to respond to this. That does, did not in any way represent the voice of the billions of people or millions in India who are unconnected. And these decisions are directly going to affect them, whether they get affordable connectivity or not. So as a researcher, I just draw caution. I worry about things you were talking about. Representation of which groups, who are we asking? Do they have a voice on this digital platform? Mm -hmm. That's all. Yeah. Thinking of which voices on digital platforms, we've got five minutes and a couple of questions. Um, lady at the back behind you, sir, I think she was sitting no, he, he, He's first, is he? Go on, T tell me your name and uh, ask your question, please. Good afternoon, my name is Gualdo Jimenez. I'm from El Salvador, Central America. In my country, the government want to approve a tax, a specific tax uh, the, of 10% of the telephone call, uh, internet, and TV uh, for para algunos de nosotros. Eso tendrá un impacto negativo en los en la gente. What's the tax for? It's, it, it's not a tax for investment into anything in no. particular. It's just a tax, right? Okay. To go into the government coffers. So, what is, what is your opinion what, about what, this? Okay. What, what, what's your hearing about hearing that? Is that is that uh, shocking? Surprising? It's 
Shall I just, I'll start. It's not surprising. Um, many developing countries have a long, rich traditions of taxing the digital media, telecom, ICT sectors because they have poor tax bases among citizens mm -hmm. and it's very easy to tax the companies and pass on taxes on the mobile phone bills, etc. So A, it doesn't surprise me. We have had a history of universal service funds in many countries, like India, being really poorly used. Four billion dollars sitting in the government, never being used, and most of the citizens unconnected. So in theory, this is great that you have taxes maybe and use it for connectivity, but if it is such a merit good, we should do it out of general taxation, not taxing the companies that are already in the sector. So it's really sort of economically stupid, I think. Second, the history of governments, poorly governed countries, of being able to spend that money usefully in the way they say it. There's no track record of that happening, I'm sorry. So I don't think it's a good idea. Lady had a question back there. Yeah, um, comment and a question. My name is Heather Hudson from the University of Alaska, Anchorage. Um, coming back to your question a few rounds ago about regulatory, what are there any regulatory changes or issues? Uh, I would say that one to keep in mind is regulation to make sure the networks themselves are open because to competition and resale because one of the sources of innovation is small providers, they can be ISPs, they can be other groups who actually could provide services um, if they can get access, affordable access to capacity. Although in many countries it's just assumed that um, there's no market in smaller and rural communities and therefore um, they must be monopolies. Um, so I was wondering about your opinion about open access and um, dark fiber as an example resale for last and, and competitive last mile or first mile services. Who fancies answering that one? Let me challenge. Mm -hmm. that, um, in general sense, I share with you your uh, views, but we also think about open doesn't mean of the free. Mm -hmm. If you have something to use of these resources, now now we are talking, everybody talking about based on the ICT, which means ICT is now our social infrastructure, social resources. Use of this resource, we need something payment because we need a continuous improvement of our infrastructure, our resources. Only way is during our usage, we need a proper payment system. If not the case, do not think about this improvement. No, I, I agree. I wasn't implying free like Nick Negroponte, no, no. Yeah. but uh, just, um, some opportunity for other providers and, and hopefully affordable or competitive pricing. Sure, yeah, but the only point is, having said that, open of access, open to the service, this is very uh, imperative uh, conditions for facilitate our innovations. Cause Previously, with the monopolized situation, that was something controlled, something limitations of this access or access to the service. But now, so many, many, many areas is already going into the full competition. Still, some areas have some difficulties, but I believe this will continue of this open, mm -hmm. but it's very important to facilitate of these innovations, I believe. I think this point on open is not free is really important because I hear it conflated in many, many fora, which is problematic. Um, openness is absolutely vital. We worried, you know, back in the past decade about open networks and the backhaul. But now we need to worry about open platforms, like who can get inside the walled garden, who can put an app on Facebook. That really has SME micro-entrepreneur implications because we've got young people developing apps and if they can't get it in the right platform, they're not even playing. You know? What's stopping them? Um, it could be a closed platform. It uh, may not allow them to test it in the right way. There could be exclusive arrangements. So a streaming music provider may not allow another streaming music provider to be on that platform, things like that, competition issues. Could be payment issues. They can't take international payments, like in Sri Lanka, PayPal doesn't work. So app developers need a foreign credit card or a friend's bank account. They have incredibly popular apps, which they just can't get paid for. So this has implications on how they make money. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? 
gentleman over here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mokhtar from Tunisia. I have a couple of questions. One of them is quite bold, I'm sorry for that. Uh, in the frame of uh, what Mrs. Elani uh, just said, in all these SMEs uh, uh, getting difficulties maybe to grow up or to uh, uh, scale up, as uh, the lady from GZ said before, uh, can we, uh, is it convenient today to talk about uh, protectionist measures from uh, governments. Is it a word that it's acceptable in the, the, the global framework we have today? I know that in Europe, in Western Europe, there are some talks about this uh, subject. Protecting uh, national... We'll be attending the welcome reception at the Palace of Arts. <laughs> Sorry. Reminding to proceed to the registration hall and board the shuttle buses parked in the front door. <laughs> so my question is not convenient, so I will <laughs> So I know this word is not very... But uh, uh, we maybe one, one day or the other we need maybe to, talk, to use uh, 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 words like that. Does this anybody want to have a go, a quick sorry, go at answering sorry, that question? Now it's, it's, now it's finished. Answer. Sorry, could we, does anybody want to have a quick go at uh, okay. answering Just that? The, the, the second one, but quick, I, I know it's difficult to, to answer the first one. The second one is regarding public consultation. Are we sure that the panel representing this uh, answer or this contribution, it is appropriate? Not about the, 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 uh, the, uh, what you said, the, the community that is not connected and cannot answer, but even those answers, are we have a secure process that make us certain that those are expressions of citizens? Is that an appropriate process? Mm. I mean, for, for me, we have to change our thinking, whether we are private sector or anything. And I'm going out on a limb here. Intellectual property would no longer be the revenue model in the next five to ten years. It would be intellect sharing that would de develop the revenue. We are already seeing it. Even in intelligence communities, we have seen that countries have started sharing security and intelligence information, even though they started with proprietary stuff that they hold close to their chest. So, and a lot of people might kill me for this, but I really believe that it's intellect sharing that would be the revenue model, not the intellectual property right. The second, we have to stop thinking of people as passive recipients of every information and service. They are the, the, country, the strong communities make strong citizens, strong citizens make strong countries. Mm -hmm unless we have the communities take ownership, and unless we have the communities involved in the decision-making process, you cannot have sustainable development because no government has the resources or the people to make it happen. And it might sound like an outrageous sta statement, but we have seen country after country after country that this is becoming true. Marvellous. Okay, well, it's um, 25 past six now. I think we'd better wrap it up. Thanks mm -hmm. to all the people on the panel. Uh, apparently, some of us might have to go and get a bus in order to go and have dinner with the Hungarian president. So, thanks a lot for coming, and uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>